welcome Ruby. We are going to hear from Ruby Valia on digital transformations in retail banking industry. Uh, Ruby has been a technology leader in retail banking for many years, also uh, worked on digital transformation in telecom and media industries. Most recently, he's been the EVP and head of retail banking at HSBC. Prior to that, he served in similar roles at TD Bank and uh, Dow Jones and Viacom. So uh, Ruby, take it from here, please. Sure. Okay, thank you for that introduction, Atul. Again, I'm Ruby Walia, and I'm here to talk about digital transformation um, in consumer banking, AKA retail banking. Um, so uh, I'll start with uh, a little bit of context first, um, uh, just you know, especially for people uh, who uh, aren't familiar with the industry. So uh, banking has been around um, for a couple of thousand years, uh, but banking as we know it uh, got started in Tuscany in Northern Italy in the 14th century. Um, at the time, Italian bankers would go to their local piazza, the town square, uh, and wait for customers at a bench. The Italian word for bench is banqua, which is where we get the word bank from. Uh, so fast forwarding um, from 500 years ago to the US, uh, in the 19th century, banking was really a very exclusive service available just for very wealthy people. Um, two people changed that in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, Amadio uh, Giannini, uh, he started the Bank of Italy in San Francisco and it eventually became the Bank of America. Uh, and then there was Charles Merrill, uh, who was one of the partners of Merrill Lynch when it was known as Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner and Smith. That was the full name of the company. So both these people, really believed in serving, as Giannini put it, the little fellow, right? They, they focused, they, they introduced a broad range of services and they actively marketed to uh, everyday consumers rather than uh, very rich people. Um, and now, you know, next in a bit of a preview for the transformational impact that digital transformation can have I'm going to fast forward to Kenya in 2007. So uh, for those who know me personally, that year is memorable for me because my second son was born that year. But for Kenyans, it was the year that the local telco, Safaricom, in collaboration with Vodafone, introduced this new service called M-Pesa. Now the word Pesa, has roots in Persian and several Indian languages, and it means money. Uh, and it was absorbed into Swahili. Um, and so M-Pesa was a very logical name because uh, M for mobile, Pesa for money. Uh, this was a menu option baked into feature phones. Remember, this is before smartphones. Uh, that Safaricom, again, the telco in Kenya sold, right? Um, and th if you navigated through those menus, you could deposit money, you could maintain a balance, you could send money. Over time, they added bill pay and, uh, and even loans. Uh, the other innovation that they introduced was instead of opening branches, uh, they co-opted small shopkeepers into becoming agents or branches. So if you wanted to deposit money into your account, you would go to one of those shopkeepers, you would give them your money, uh, you would make an entry on your phone through the menu system, uh, and then the shopkeeper would verify it. They would put in their password into your phone uh, and your bank balance on the phone would reflect the change, right? So. In 2007, Kenya had a population of about 38 million people. And there were 40 banks operating in the country. They had about 500 branches and most of those were clustered around the big cities. So actually most of the population was unbanked. Within three years, M-Pesa had 
12 million accounts, right? And there've been lots of studies about the positive impact on the country, including a certain amount of GDP growth that was attributed just to M-Pesa, right? So final bit of history, coming back to the US, there's a bank called USAA. Um, they invented in 2009, this notion of depositing a check by taking a picture of it. In my mind, that's a tentpole event. Uh, one of the first examples of someone saying, how can we use a smartphone to rethink how a bank serves customers, right? Okay, so, um, let me see. Here we go. Um, so now what I want to do is just quickly run through some numbers about U.S. banking to give you a sense of the ecosystem. There are about 8,500 banks that operate in the U.S., plus about 5,000 credit unions. Um, you know, there's only about 25 to 30,000 banks globally. No one knows the exact number. These are, you know, pretty good estimates though. Um, and a fourth of them, more than a fourth of them do business in the US or, you know, they're either US based or they do business here. Um, and I guess in a sense that's in keeping with the size of the economy because with a GDP of 20 trillion, uh, it's the world's largest economy in comparison, China's GDP, which is the second largest is about 13 trillion. You know, so it gives you a sense of context. Um, so uh, the other couple of things that I think are noteworthy on this page. One is that in spite of having 15,000 places where you can put your money, uh, about 8% of the population is unbanked. Um, and then you know the last line, uh, there's about a hundred trillion dollars uh, in non-cash payment transactions that happen every year to support our twenty trillion dollar economy. So about five dollars uh, in movement for every uh, GDP dollar, right? Which is sort of an interesting number. Okay. Um, so what are some trends? Uh, in the US, uh, the number of branches is going down. Uh, branches are pretty expensive to operate. The general rule in the industry is that a, a single branch costs about one to $3 million to operate annually. And that's mostly a function of location. So a branch in, in a, a high rent um, uh, city will be more expensive than one in a rural area. Um, and so banks are incentivized to migrate simple services online or to mobile apps to reduce cost. And that's a win-win because as a consumer, I would much rather take a picture of a check to deposit it uh, rather than driving to a bank and handing it to a teller along with a deposit slip, right? Um, so as these kinds of transactions migrate to that self-service digital model, not only are there fewer branches, but they're becoming smaller in footprint and they have less staff working inside them. And that staff provides a more selective set of higher value services, right? So this has already been in progress for the last few years and it's widely expected to continue. Next, uh, P2P payments, person-to-person -person payments have finally arrived. Uh, and these became popular in other countries before they came to the US, um, but things like Venmo and even Apple Pay uh, and Zelle, you know, people now know what those are and they're uh, increasingly using them to send money to each other. Um, we are actually one of the last developed economies where we're still writing a lot of checks. In Europe, most consumers haven't written a check in years because they've transitioned to digital payment mechanisms. Um, and the other, uh, another trend that's taking place is uh, speeding up how fast these P2P payments uh, work. So Venmo feels pretty fast already, but now there's a focus on real time money movement. So, uh, the Fed is, the US Fed is working on a system and the Clearinghouse, which is a cooperative association of about 25 banks, they already have a system that many of those banks have implemented or have signed up for. 
there's new forms of currency. I think most people know about Bitcoin and other you know, uh, blockchain based currencies. Um, there are also digital banks, banks that don't have any branches, but are mostly just a mobile app and a call center to resolve problems. Um, and then finally, there are all kinds of innovative new services being introduced like robo advisors, uh, which make investing available to even more consumers. And these brand new services, you know, they didn't really exist until digital became a thing. So these are really new inventions in a sense. Okay. So next, I wanna just talk about some macro trends uh, that are driving these changes. Um, uh, so next, you know, I want to talk about some macro trends. Um, I can probably, frankly, spend an hour talking about this slide, but I'll try to cover the main points in just a few minutes. Um, four broad trends, uh, trends driving a lot of change. Uh, the first is uh, the very enthusiastic way in which most consumers have embraced digital services in their lives, um, especially around their smartphone. Uh, just using me as an example, I get up every morning with the alarm on my Apple Watch, which has been monitoring my sleep pattern overnight. Then I check the weather forecast to decide how I'm going to dress. I look at news alerts, my calendar, my email, all before the day really gets started, right? Um, secondly, there's the technology hockey stick curve that shows no sign of letting up with new capabilities arriving faster and faster every day. Um, things like the cloud, artificial intelligence, conversational interfaces like Alexa. Um, these are all changing how we live our lives. The change I'm looking forward to the most, I think, is autonomous vehicles. Now, you know, um, I think that's a few years away, but uh, the possibilities are tantalizing. And think about being able to send your empty car uh, without you in it, to the airport to pick someone up or uh, settling into the car at the end of the day as it drives itself and then maybe relaxing with a glass of wine, right? Um, so these inventions, they don't just change our lives and our lifestyles, but they also change the kinds of services that financial institutions offer. So when you have self-driving cars, do you buy one for yourself or do you buy one to share with a bunch of friends and maybe all of you, you know, sh share for it financially um, because the car could drive itself between your homes, right? When, and you could have, you could have an app that's, that allows you to schedule when you use it and when your friends use it. So when you have models like that, how do you finance something? You know, banks have typically financed a car for one person based on their credit history. But if a bunch of you are getting together to uh, finance a car together, then that changes um, how that happens. For that matter, how do you insure a car like that, right? Um, so there's all kinds of um, change that uh, is driven by these new capabilities as they're made available to us. Um, next, there's the competitive landscape. So of course, there are the traditional banks that you know, typically they offer a broad set of financial services. It's like a one-stop shop for everything you might need financially. But now there's also digital services that specialize in just one service, like maybe making loans. And they do it really, really well, right? So because they focus on that, um, they're typically digital startups that, you know, fintechs that are focusing on taking one tiny slice of financial services and saying, we want to build a fantastic consumer experience around it. Uh, I remember years ago, I was at a bank and we were uh, through an RFP looking at partnering with um, some fintechs that were offering online lending capabilities. And uh, one of the CEOs uh, of a fintech said to me, look, uh, we're able to make decisions in real time. So someone goes to their website, puts in all their information. And when they get to the last form, they hit submit. And the organization, 98% of the time, they make a decision, yes, no, we're going to lend you the money. And if they say yes, they're going to transfer it electronically into your checking account at a different bank. Uh, 
And for the 2% that they can't make a real-time decision, someone gets back to them within 48 hours, right? In comparison at the bank, you know, if you walk into a branch, getting the same kind of a service typically took a month, right? And so um, it's, a, it's, it's a radically different kind of experience. And so we, of course, wanted to partner with them and, and we ended up doing that. And, and so that's an example of a transformation that took place, right? So again, there are all these FinTechs that are offering one tiny slice of a service at a time. Um, and, and they're a, a, a competitor really for banks. Um, then there are other non-traditional competitors um, like Apple and Facebook and Amazon, um, you know, the big tech organizations that uh, aren't shy about wanting to get into financial services and have for the most part. Although again, they're still only dealing with a tiny set of services that you know, they think they're most able to play in. Uh, but the big banks are obviously worried that um, the tech companies are going to compete more and more with them. And you know, the reality is that the big tech giants, uh, they have the technology capability, they have the money, um, they know how to build, launch and market consumer products at scale. And they have brands that might resonate more with some consumers. So they really are um, a serious source of competition. Um, the fourth trend is changing regulation and business models. In Europe, for example, they have something called PST2, which requires banks to provide an API. Any company, even a startup can build an app, connect to the API and start serving the bank's customers, right? So the bank gets disintermediated because someone else's mobile app is provide is, is the front end to the services that the bank provides to its customers. And, and the customer might you know, rightfully say, well, actually, I don't know if I'm a customer of the bank, maybe I'm a customer of whichever company provided me with the mobile app because that's the logo I see the most, right? Um, and then, uh, you know, when you look at services like Venmo that do P2P payments essentially free, um, that changes the revenue model because it's hard to compete with free. Now all of a sudden you've got to think about, okay, how do we, you know, uh, uh, what are some new sources of revenue that we could use to subsidize for, pay for services like that? So when you put all this together, it sort of helps you understand why the US banking uh, ecosystem is evolving as rapidly as it is, right? Okay, next. Um, so uh, where is some of this going? Well, uh, when you put together two trends, right? One being the consumerization of technology that we just talked about, and then the consumerization of financial services, um, you know, uh, that we talked about a few minutes ago, you put those two together and it actually points towards the uh, something called the experience economy where um, goods and services uh, are, are uh, designed to emphasize the effect that they can have on people's lives, right? Um, and so people talk about, uh, there's this notion of something called the customer moment, right? And so, uh, can banks and other financial service organizations provide uh, customer moments that feel like they're different from the ones that other uh, banks are providing? And we'll talk about some examples of that to give you a sense of what we're saying, right? So um, if you take even something like Uber, which is, you know, you don't think of that as a financial service, you think of it as a transportation service. Um, but I've put it here for a reason, which is that there is a there isn't a financial element to the Uber service, um, and B, you can actually break Uber down into a set of three experiences. So the first experience is when you start the app and you hail a car, um, the experience of seeing the the little black ant on your on your mobile screen you know, come crawling towards you, um, that takes some of the uncertainty of, I don't know when I'm going to be able to hail a cab, 
out of the con the customer's experience. So they feel comfortable. Okay, there's a, an element of predictability. My car is going to be here in so many minutes. Maybe if it's raining, I'll even stay inside until the car is really close, and then I'll step outside and make a dash for the door. Right. Um, so it's an experiential thing. That first element of it. The second element is security. I have um, a son who. Uh, just graduated from high school this year and started college, but he was going to high school in Manhattan. Uh, we live in Northern New Jersey. And so um, I was completely comfortable sometimes with him getting into an Uber and taking the service home because if he were to go missing for whatever reason, um, at least the authorities would have a starting point. We know which car he got into, who the driver was. If he got into an anonymous yellow cab, we would have no idea where to get started, right? So again, security is sort of an experiential thing. And then the third part is at the end of the ride, you step out of the car, you close the door and you move on. You don't stop to pull out your wallet, your credit card, your, your you know, make change, um, because if you're paying in cash, because uh, the transaction, the payment happens in the cloud. Um, and so, again, that's an experiential thing. And uh, it, it kind of really just highlights how important cust customer experiences are. Uh, and, and I think are a big reason why Uber took off like it did. Um, a couple of other examples, more solidly in the banking space, um, uh, TD Bank in Canada, uh, they, uh, their customers who take uh, a train to commute to work, uh, in the morning they might get a push notification from the bank telling them their train is late, obviously only if it is late. Um, and if it's late, then what are the next three times at which a train will come to the station that they go to? So it's customized for them. And if the train is late by more than 15 minutes, uh, they automatically, uh, the bank will automatically get you a refund, which is you know, pretty amazing. Um, you don't even have to start the app and push a button. It just happens in the background, right? So uh, it's about creating engagement. It's about, you know, th there's a financial element to that interaction. It's something that the bank does to add value to the customer's life. It drives stickiness, retention, engagement um, from a customer's perspective, it makes them comfortable about giving up their geolocation uh, data, which is uh, key to making this happen. Um, so, so it's a great experience. Um, uh, uh, another thing that TD Bank does in Canada, you know, these are capabilities that will come to the US over time, um, is that uh, every time you do a debit or a credit transaction, you use your debit card, you use your credit card, um, you immediately get a push notification that tells you how much you spent, where you spent, automatically categorize it. Is it so if I spend a hundred bucks at the grocery store, it tells you, okay, you spend a hundred dollars in groceries and it shows you your spend velocity this month on groceries compared to a historical norm for you. So you can immediately get a sense of, am I pacing ahead of or behind uh, what I typically do? And you know that gives you a sense of, uh, do you need to manage your spend in that area a bit more effectively? Um, so again, another great experience. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of digital banks, uh, Starling and Revolut. Um, I, I won't get into a lot of details, but uh, you know these are now these started. Uh, both of these started in the UK. They're now in the US. Um, they're in the App Store. You can go. You can download them. Um, there's all kinds of interesting um, card con the controls inside these apps for managing your money, uh, for managing digital receipts when you spend your money. Uh, for receiving and automatically taking advantage of loyalty affairs. Um, Revolut has this very sophisticated children's account capability. Um, th there's all kinds of interesting things you can do there, um, which the traditional banks haven't offered as yet, but now they're sort of you know looking at them and saying, maybe these are things that we should be doing. Um, Trove is um, an insurance company, uh, digital insurance company. They actually don't 
they're not direct to consumers themselves. They partner with insurance companies to offer their service. But essentially, you can take a picture of something. And just with that picture in real time, you can uh, buy insurance on it. So if you go shopping for a new, uh, I don't know, expensive camera, you take a picture of it and you can, you can buy insurance for it on the spot, right? OK. Um, so uh, what I want to do now is uh, talk a little bit about where are some areas of opportunity where, um, where these changes are taking place in the US banking system. Um, this is a very, very uh, 30,000 foot level, very simplified uh, taxonomy of what a bank looks like, a retail bank, right? So there's some customer facing uh, aspects to it. And then there's a whole bunch of back office stuff. So I'm just gonna do a deep dive on three areas, um, how a bank, uh, a consumer bank acquires new customers, how they serve them, which in the industry is called engagement. And, um, and one of the things all banks try to do is once you establish a relationship with a new customer, you try to deepen that relationship by cross selling or upselling them with new services that you offer, right? Okay. Um, so customer acquisition, um, branches, you know, uh, one of the reasons branches exist, frankly, is to help acquire customers. Um, and so each branch typically will acquire customers within a five mile radius. Um, websites, if you, know, if you could create a website where you can go and sign up to be a customer, well, those aren't geofenced, right? So essentially, uh, you could apply anywhere. You don't have to be within five miles of the server. Um, uh, and actually today, um, most of the large banks that have a reasonably mature digital capability they get the majority of their new customers through digital channels and it could be going to a website, it could be on your mobile device, you can even do it through Alexa actually. Um, uh, so that's a big radical change in how the banks think of their branches, right? Um, and so when you become a customer of the bank through a digital channel, it's not just about opening a checking account. You can also open savings accounts. You can do a certificate of deposit. You can uh, apply for a credit card and have it approved in real time. You can do the same thing with a personal loan. Um, mortgages also you can do digitally. They don't happen in real time, but at least you could get the bulk of that mortgage journey done online. So this actually transforms very fundamentally how uh, banks spend their money marketing, right? Instead of doing billboards and, and mailers that come through the snail mail, um, it's all about leveraging the digital ecosystem and using data to identify the right prospects and then to um, drive them towards your uh, the website, which is your funnel, uh, where you can then lead those prospects through uh, a few pages where they provide the information and you can in real time assess the information that an applicant is giving you and decide whether um, uh, you, the bank, want to accept this person as a customer and open an account for them, right? And, you know, this is where some of the, the, the art uh, comes into play, right? There's a lot of technology. When you're interacting with someone on the other side of the internet, how do you decide? Is this person who they say they are? Um, how do you establish their identity? And then once you've established their identity, how do you assess their creditworthiness? And then the hardest part is, how do you assess what their intentions are? Right? That gets really hard. Um, but if you're going to uh, open a savings account, okay, that's easy, right? You're, they're just gonna give you money, which you're gonna keep. But if they're going to open a checking account or if they're asking for overdraft privileges or if they're asking for a credit card or worst case, if they're asking for a loan, um, you've got to do a lot of um, digital housekeeping to make sure that 
yes, this person uh, is who they say they are, that they're trustworthy, that they and that you're comfortable and it makes commercial sense to to open an account and to do business with them, right? So there's a lot that's happening in that space. And, um, and then it's not just about opening the account, but the first many months of the journey with that customer, as you develop trust in their behavior, there's a lot of monitoring that happens automatically. There's AI solutions that are being deployed um, that help the bank develop confidence in this customer and give them more and more ability to act um, without scrutinizing everything they're doing. Um, and while you're doing all this, because of a whole bunch of compliance regulations, um, you've got to make sure that, well, you're in compliance with them. Um, and, and so uh, there's a tremendous amount of technology that works behind the scenes to enable some of these things. And obviously, uh, when banks compete with each other, um, their, the quality of their digital capabilities in these areas um, make a difference in how effectively they're competing in the marketplace, right? Okay, next. Um, uh, customer engagement. Once someone's become a customer, how do you serve them? So, um, again, traditionally, a lot of servicing happened in the branches. Uh, but now banks really want to focus on digital capabilities, A, because they're self-service for the most part, um, so they're uh, cheaper to offer, but also because customers demand that kind of service, right? Um, I don't want to drive to the bank branch to deposit a check. I want to be able to do it in my kitchen. Um, so uh, if you look at, you know, there's this, this notion of something called the digital twin. Um, you take a book uh, which weighs a certain amount, uh, a paper book, uh, and you compare that to uh, an ebook on an iPad. Um, I know I do, uh, in spite of my collection of books, um, I actually do most of my reading now on my iPad because. Uh, I can carry a whole bunch of books with me. Um, they're instantaneously accessible uh, wherever I'm in my house or, or you know, when I start traveling again, I'll have my library with me. Um, so there's all kinds of benefits and they're usually cheaper too. Uh, so, uh, so this whole notion of, of digital products being better than analog versions means that um, the banks are all trying to figure out how to create the best possible version of the services that they've historically produced. And those services um, are, are services that can actually drive engagement, right? So think about TD Bank notifying customers whose trains are late in the morning, that's an interaction that would never have happened in the past. Um, but because digital services are now here, uh, to stay. Um, every time that interaction happens, uh, it deepens the relationship and the bond between the customer and the service provider. Um, and so uh, banks are really thinking about um, how can we create these kinds of uh, services that uh, allow us to engage with customers much more frequently than we used to in the past. Um, the banks historically have had this KPI uh, they measure how many customers, active customers they have at any point in time. And the yardstick is if a customer goes into a branch once in 90 days, they're considered active. Well, with digital capabilities, um, banks are completely rethinking that. It's more like, okay, uh, have we been able to interact with our customers every single day? Um, that's what makes them an active customer, not interacting with them once in every 90 days, right? Okay. Um, Another change that's happening is that uh, historically interactions were initiated by customers. Customers decided 
when they would walk into a branch, which branch they walked into it, uh, walked into. Um, if they were using the call center, they also decided when they were going to pick up the phone and call. Um, even when they started using mobile apps, um, the customer decided when they were going to start up the mobile app and initiate that interaction. So now the interesting thing is that there's actually opportunities for banks to initiate those interactions. They can uh, proactively message a customer. Um, they can send a push notification, uh, which pops up on the phone and you know almost demands a certain amount of attention. It can be somewhat intrusive. And so the banks are somewhat hesitant. You know, they've got to be very judicious about when they initiate those interactions because uh, customers have to feel like those interactions are, are, are adding value somehow. They're not just another uh, random message or e-statement is ready. You know, that just feels intrusive to send a push notification to tell someone that their e-statement is ready. So, um, so banks are actually spending a lot of time thinking about uh, what kinds of interactions can we create that would be meaningful for customers? Um, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. So uh, let's say you go car shopping, uh, you're at a dealership. Wouldn't it be great that if the bank could send you a push notification saying, Ruby, you're uh, pre-approved for a car loan for X amount of dollars, uh, go pick out the color, we'll take care of the paperwork, right? That becomes a delightful service. And the bank is um, using your geolocation through your mobile app on your phone to determine where you are um, within their systems. They know everything about you. They know whether or not you're credit worthy and they can make a decision and make an offer in the spur of the moment which will actually save you some money if you don't have to finance through the dealership, right? So that's an example of uh, a service that a bank can provide where they can initiate that interaction where that, and the customer would actually appreciate getting that message because it helps them with a problem that they would be facing shortly. Um, and so uh, there's, uh, there's lots of then, you know, uh, and, and, and again, you know, you, you can take that and you can extend that. There's a few examples listed on this page if, if you're going through it, but, you know, just randomly pick one more and then move on. Uh, uh, paying bills, right? Um, rather than having to go into the mobile app to uh, or, or logging in to pay all your bills, wouldn't it be great if... Uh, the bank could, with AI, figure out which ones you pay routinely, uh, see if those bills are within uh, the, the normal range that they are every month, and then just send you one message saying, you know, with a summary of the bills that are due and that the bank can pay automatically, and just say, you know, do these all look right? Do you want me to go ahead and pay them? You press one button, and the bank takes care of it automatically, right? So just another example of how uh, banks can use digital capabilities to introduce more convenience into your lives, right? Okay. So um, uh, I'll spend 30 seconds on cross-sell, upsell. Uh, uh, if you've got a credit card from a bank and uh, it's got a fixed credit limit, uh, and let's say it's $10,000, uh, but you uh, have already spent $9,000, you've only got $1,000 left, you walk into some place like a jewelry store where you could spend a lot of money. Um, if the bank knows that you're good for it, uh, that, that offering you more credit wouldn't put you in uh, a financial difficulty, um, they can send you a push notification saying, Ruby, great news, we've decided to in increase your credit limit by $3,000 press this button and you know, to accept it and, and we'll do it. Um, there are actually banks doing that now. So you know, it's just another example of how banks are doing proactive messaging, pro anticipating services that you might need and proactively providing it to you, right? Um, and that's an example of cross-sell upsell because you already had a relationship with the bank, but now they're deepening the relationship. Um, 
And then, you know, beyond sort of some of those three traditional areas of acquisition, engagement, and cross-sell upsell, there are new kinds of services like, um, like robo-advisors. You know, there's companies like Betterment. Uh, you can open an account, you can put some money in there, and they automatically uh, will invest for you. Um, and you know, this is a service that, frankly, didn't exist until digital capabilities became a reality, right? Okay. Um, and then, uh, you know, just last slide. Um, so what are some key takeaways, right? So first of all, financial services are evolving dramatically. Um, the macro trends, you know, make it clear that uh, this transformation will actually just accelerate over time, uh, not get slower. For the next 10 years, I think you're gonna see uh, radically uh, improved uh, experiences being introduced. Um, and companies are thinking about these experiences, both in terms of what constitutes a routine everyday moment uh, versus something that's a more significant life event. Um, helping you get a mortgage would be a more significant life event. Um, helping pay for your train commuter ticket uh, is more of an everyday moment. Um, but they're actually you know, looking at these and saying, how can we add value? How can we reduce friction? How can we introduce convenience? Um, and, and the word delightful, even though it feels a bit corny is actually relevant uh, because uh, banks have the opportunity to create delightful events that um, that customers will seek, and and uh, and and ultimately for the banks uh, translate into bottom line results. Right. Um, uh, so so when you look at you know ten years from now, which are the banks that are sort of winning, if you will. These are the companies that create experience portfolios. They actually you know, stop thinking about products so much. They start thinking more about what's the portfolio of experiences that they can provide um, and uh, how personalized and contextual uh, can they have these experiences for their customers? Um, can they go beyond uh, mobile apps and, and websites uh, to leverage things like push notifications and conversational interfaces to create uh, rich two-way interactions. Um, they'll also, you know, one of the changes you'll see is um, they'll start becoming more aggressive about how they use data because data fuels experiences like this. And so banks will do it, uh, the ones that do it successfully will do it in a very uh, upfront, transparent way um, that preserves customer trust, right? Uh, because you don't want to be, you know, companies like Facebook have gotten into trouble because uh, they sometimes uh, either kept changing the rules by which they handled data or, or maybe, you know, they weren't as transparent as they could have been. Um, Banks, by their very nature, tend to be conservative, tend to, uh, well, they're also very regulated. So I think what you'll see is banks leveraging data in a, in a very ethical way. Um, and then uh, uh, what you'll see finally is that customers will evolve their perspective on data privacy as they get comfortable about sharing their data because it provides these kinds of delightful experiences. Um, and then the last thing I will say is that there's going to be a tremendous amount of AI that's leveraged uh, by the banks to fuel these experience portfolios. So hopefully that gives you a sense of the kinds of transformation that's coming in retail banking. Thank you, Ruby. Wonderful presentation. Uh, we've run out of time. We're running into the next speaker's time slot. What I will do is I'll ask one question that's on my mind. And Ruby, if you wouldn't mind joining the Slack channel and uh, maybe other people can ask you questions there and you can respond online. Yep. Uh, you should have an invite to Slack from this morning, right? I should, I will pull it up while we talk. Okay, 
So the question I have for you is, have you, what kind of pressures on the retail banking system have you seen as a result of the COVID crisis? Of course, there are a lot more e-commerce transactions. So you're dealing with a lot more volumes of transactions. Uh, what else do you think? So, so I would say there are two or three things. One, um, you know, and the immediate challenge was, what do we do with our branches? Uh, which ones do we open? Which ones do we close? What kinds of uh, safety protocols do we institute? Uh, so that was sort of the immediate crunch. Then the second thing was, um, uh, and, and this is really the challenge for banking, retail banking for probably the next uh, year. Uh, there are two fundamental problems. Uh, one is uh, that um, uh, interest rates are low. Uh, banks make money when interest rates are high. So if interest rates are low and are projected to stay low for a long time, uh, then their ability to uh, make to generate revenue declines. That's one issue. And then the second issue is that um, uh, with the economy and the state that it's in, um, even though they have real, you know, all the banks entered this crisis with really strong balance sheets because of all the regulatory changes that were made uh, after 2008. So they're sitting on lots of capital. Um, they're not, no one's going out of business anytime soon, uh, but the challenge is that with the economy in the shape that it's in until it starts to pick up, there's no one to lend money to. So not only are interest rates low, but there's very few customers to whom you would make a loan. So what's happening is you're actually eating away at your reserves gradually, um, waiting for the economy to recover, uh, and, and then waiting for the interest rates to edge upwards so that you're in a healthier position financially. In the meantime, you've got to continue to invest in digital capabilities because those have clearly become more relevant and important um, to help us all get through the pandemic. So that's kind of you know the, the flux that the industry is going through right now. Amazing insights, yeah, great, great. Really good talk, a very comprehensive view of the retail banking industry. Thank you very much, uh, Ruby. Uh, and uh, again, if you can join the Slack channel and if folks have other questions, please ask there. Uh, thank you, Ruby. You're welcome.